Hey everyone, today we are going to be looking at a Lexicon PCM60 reverb unit. So the PCM60 was Lexicon's first, I believe, 1U rack unit that was available for, you know, studio or consumer use. Uh, previous to this, they had the Classic 224 and later the, later the 480, uh, which were both extremely expensive and also big units. The PCM60 is, from my understanding, based on the 224 algorithms. That is, you have two algorithms, plate and room and it is a very good sounding unit. Now the PCM70 came out shortly after. Uh, this came out in 1984 and it was a little over a year later that the PCM70 came out which also was based on the algorithms of the Classic 224 but gave you a lot more options in terms of usability. There was a lot more algorithms besides your standard plate and room. You actually had, you know, it was microprocessor controlled so you could save presets, adjust parameters much more than the basic size and reverb time that this, you know, PCM60 gives you there. Um, it was a much more powerful unit. That said, the PCM60 is still a good sounding unit. The dead simplicity of it is what makes it very nice and a lot of people, it's one of the reasons why a lot of people like it. And you can get them very cheap, especially when they're not working, which is the case of this one. So just a quick overview of the PCM60. You have your standard inputs, you have your level input, you have your mix from 100% dry to 100% wet, and then you have your level output. Uh, you have a bypass, hard bypass in the front, which is really nice. Your two algorithm switches, plate and room. And then you can adjust the actual sound, uh, or in terms of reverb time, by adjusting the small to large parameter buttons, and then also reverb time from short to long. Uh, the manual goes over in a little bit more detail exactly how they adjust the uh, the room size as it appears you know in uh, DSP land, but you have adjustable time from roughly around half second to almost four seconds of reverb time with this unit, and then finally it offers a bass and treble contour that you can adjust to kind of tweak the sound a little bit as well. So on the back, you have a uh, standard mono input, which is typical of most reverb units of this area. And then you have your left and right output, uh, stereo, you know, stereo output coming from the reverb unit. You have your uh, adjustable inputs for matching the equipment that you're going to be feeding this to. And then you also have an effects send and effects return, which is kind of neat on this piece of gear. Uh, those are actually in line with the audio input, so you can chain effects in right before the DSP on this, so you can uh, you know, have a little more flexibility with, with tuning the sound, if that makes sense for you. So as I mentioned, this unit is not working. I purchased it broken for a very cheap. Uh, overall, it's in very good, good condition though. It's very clean on the front, just a little bit of rack marks from you know being rack mounted. And it was probably a studio unit, just based on how clean it is. A lot of these things get really beat up when you know they're used on the road. It powers on and passes audio, but the audio outputs are low on it, and I'll show that here in a minute. And then there's actually no reverb at all. So even when you have it out of bypass and you're feeding audio through it and you have your mix and level set correctly, you don't hear any reverb. So there's something going on inside here which we'll take a look at it. It's most likely going to have power supply problems which is typical of all gear in this era. Uh, all the capacitors need to be replaced which you need to do on you know any 30 year old plus piece uh, gear. And we'll look and see what else is wrong. While we're in there too we'll take a look at the DSP and, and see what Lexicon is using in this and kind of compare it to the PCM70 to see what has changed. I've also done a video on the PCM70. Uh, that was quite a length, lengthy repair. Um, it was actually quite interesting if you're, if you're interested in seeing that. I'll link it in the description below. So I do know someone has been in this unit. One of the first observations is the screws in the top here are silver. It's supposed to have black screws. So I know somebody's opened it up and been inside. So we will, for, well first I'll power it up and just we'll see what it is, uh, it's doing when you pass audio through it just to confirm that. And then we'll open it up and take a look inside. All right, I've got a power down here at the bench. I'm feeding it from a Roland Alpha Juno 1, just because it's another synth I have sitting here at the bench. And I'm just feeding it in through a little mixer to my uh, bench speakers here, which aren't very good sounding, but they'll do just for listening to this unit. So, as we can see, we've got audio coming through it, and bypass is off. But, regardless of the actual setting, you know, you're applying to the reverbs and algorithm. There's, there's no reverb at all. And if you put it in bypass, actually you almost lose all your audio, which is interesting. So I'm guessing primarily power supply is going to be the number one problem on this. We'll take a look at that. It's probably going to need a full recap, and then we'll look into it further to see why, if that doesn't resolve it, into why you know there is no additional or no reverb coming out of this. So let's take it apart.
So here's a look inside, and first thing that pops out immediately is definitely this hilarious bodge of capacitors here that someone has attempted to replace. So, like I thought, somebody's been in here before. Besides that mess, everything else looks okay. So all these capacitors look original. The solder hasn't been touched, so they're probably original to the unit. Um, this, we'll have to check the value, was supposed to be replaced, but they didn't have the value, so they, they bodged in three caps to make the value. I hope nobody paid for that repair, by the way, because that's, that's pretty crappy. Uh, these two caps, I'll have to check. That was a microfarad at 35 volts. They look original as well. Nobody's replaced those. So we'll take, we'll bring the camera around to get a little bit closer look. So here's this hilarious bodge cap job where they got three caps in there to replace a single value that they didn't have. I mean, I guess whatever you got to do to get it done, but like I said, I hope that this wasn't actually somebody that paid someone to repair that, because that's pretty crappy. But anyway, underneath this cap, we got a pin out here with all of our voltages. So we'll ver verify all those voltages when we power it back up and actually see where we're at. But we'll take a look at the power supply, at least the input side over here. So AC comes in, jumps through the board, you got a fuse, goes to the front panel switch. Um, voltage selection switch here too, so you can switch this unit between 120 and 240 volt. And this is simply a multi-tap transformer. When this, all this switch is doing is changing the taps on the transformer. So it's very easy to convert this on voltages if you happen to buy a European unit and want to convert it to US voltage or the opposite. Uh, you'll have to swap the fuse too, so when you double the voltage you, you have the current. So this will be a different fuse in that regard if you're going, you know, if you're going from 240 to 110. Actually, it even says that right here. So it gives you, it tells you the fuse types to use. So I'll put secondary on this. Drops over here, and this section is your power supply. So you got a couple. You typically have several rails on here. You'll have two five volt rails for the analog and digital circuitry. Then you'll have a plus and minus, usually fifteen volt rail for all the analog circuitry, the DSP, and uh, you know the. Uh, I'm sorry, not the DSP, but the digital analog conversion. So looking at the supply here. Actually, it's labeled quite nicely, so it makes it easy. So Q3 and Q4, that's an LM317, so adjustable regulator there. It's probably 5 volts. We'll have to check that to be sure. This guy, I'm not sure what he is. I'll have to look into that one closer. And then you've got the 7915 and 7815 here. Different brands, strangely. That's a National Semiconductor. That's a Motorola. They don't look like they've been replaced, so it's kind of strange to expect two different manufacturers for those, but whatever. Uh, so in the supply, you've got two bridge rectifiers here, and then, you know, your, your required filtering caps for those. These are for the 15-volt rails here. you got another rectifier here made of discrete diodes as well, and then some more filtering caps, small filtering caps, big filtering cap probably for the 5-volt rail, and then another cap there we'll take a look at. So, DSP section lives right here. These are your, you know, this one's labeled Lexicon Proprietary DSP. You got a couple other chips in here, which we'll take a look at. Um, part numbers don't bring any immediate things to memory, but we'll take a closer look. So this is going to be a RAM. It's most likely, it's InMOS branded, so it's going to be most likely SRAM. It might be DRAM. I'm going to guess SRAM, though. We'll take a closer look at that. Uh, here's your ROMs. So these actually hold your algorithms. Uh, no battery in this unit, too. I'll mention that. Since there's no presets to save, you don't have any microprocessor in that, you know, in that regard writing stuff to you know, volatile RAM. You don't have any batteries in these to replace, which is kind of a plus of the simplicity of this unit. So you don't have to worry about a battery you know, leaking and corroding these boards. So uh, ROMs there. You got some more glue logic up here holding everything together. And then your D-Day converter. So it's a Burr Brown PCM53. Uh, a little bit older chip, as you expect. The 54, the PCM54 is what you find in most gear, you know, in the late 80s, going into the early 90s, uh, including the PCM70, including Lexicon LXP15. Uh, some other gear, some Roland uh, uh, effects processors use the PCM54 as well. Uh, a lot of older synths used it too, so it's a very common chip. PCM53 is just a little bit older, slightly less specs on that, but still a good classic uh, digital analog converter. Uh, noisy and not that great by modern standards, but at the time this was still pretty much state-of-the-art and a very expensive chip. So on the analog side over here you have your required filters for the inputs and outputs of the digital analog process. So they're going to be using, there's no A to the N here. Uh, most like most gear this era, they don't, they didn't have analog, you know, dedicated analog to digital chips. 
So they're converting the analog digital signal via successive approximation. So the, one of these op amps in here is going to be part of a, a sample and hold circuit. And along with the actual PCM53 here, which is not only used for the outputs, but also is being used as basically the register or the, uh, the voltage generator for the, the input to compare to. You find this on a lot of early effects processors like this. Nearly every one that I've worked on, from Lexicon, from Roland, from Yamaha, all do the exact same thing. So we will start by taking a look at those voltages and just seeing where we're at before we do anything else. Alright, so these are all clearly labeled in these pins as I mentioned. So we'll start by going down the, the row here. Start with positive. There's actually quite a few voltages on here, more than I realize. So positive 22. Oops, I turned it on. We have 24 volts. That's fine. We have positive 15. We have 14.9. Almost 15. That's going to be good. We have ground. We have negative 15. Right on. We have negative 22. Not 24. That's fine. We have positive 5 analog. That's within the spec. And we have positive 5 digital. A little over, but that should be okay. And then we have positive 8. We have 10. So a couple of those are a little high. Maybe capacitor related, may not be. Um, either way, it should be all within spec in terms of, of you know, what's that. So. Um, I would like to look at the power supply for Ripple, just to see if there is any Ripple on any of the lines. Um, that'd be a clear indication that, that capacitors are bad in this. Alright, I can't get in frame both the PCM60 and my scope, so I just aimed at the scope so you can see yourself in Ripple. So, it's AC coupled right now, 200 millivolts per, per division, and we'll start probing these lines. So, going down the same row, 22 volts. Definitely a little noisy, I would say. On the 15 volt, that's pretty clean. Negative 15 volt, that's clean. 22 volt, again very noisy there. Positive 5 volt, a little bit of noise there, but not terrible. That's the 5-volt analog. This is 5-volt digital. Again, a little bit of noise. Uh, there's 300 millivolts of, uh, of noise there on that rail, which isn't great. And then positive 8-volt. Again, some noise on there. Thought there was a DC off, so that wouldn't make sense. Okay, so some noise there as well. 200, 300 millivolts. Definitely not great. So I'm going to start by replacing the capacitors on this. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it won't take long. I have all those caps uh, available too. So I'll start with that just to make sure I have clean rails uh, for power before I start, uh, you know, continuing to, to troubleshoot any further. For capacitors, I'm going to be using Panasonic 105C rated caps. Uh, in this case, specifically the FC series uh, that Panasonic makes. So, like I said, these are 105C rated, so they're significantly higher than the caps that are in here, which are only 85C rated, um, and they're really high quality. So, the endurance on these is somewhere between 1,000 and 5,000 hours at 105C. So, it's it's I'm not exactly sure what the endurance was, but regardless, it's going to be significantly better than the caps that are in here. I mean, these original ones probably lasted, I don't know how long this has been dead, say 20, 30 years. You'll get that at least out of these, plus potentially more, just because they are such a higher grade capacitor. I actually had to look at the, the schematic for this to figure out what this is supposed to be. And it's supposed to be a 4700 microfarad at 16 volt capacitor. And they have two 2200 microfarad caps and a 1000 in here. So for a total of 5400 microfarad, which is higher than the 4700 you need, but Whatever, we'll do it right. So these are leaking a little bit. Not terrible, but there is some residue on the board. And here's a 
close-up of that hilarious thing. Some of these other little caps are a little leaky too, leaving some residue on the board. Some of the smaller caps are not terrible, but they're a little puffy, and there was a little bit of leakage coming out of them. They're Nishikon caps, so they were using good caps in there. Uh, again, still only 85C rated though. I mean, that all just comes down to cost. So 85C rated caps will get the job done, so manufacturers use them, even though 105C rated caps are better and will give you, you know, better light. Especially units like these, because these get hot. You know, there's no airflow in here. You know, this old TTL logic and stuff, I mean, it runs hot. Linear power supplies run hot. You can see all the, the actual regulators on this big, you know, heat sink on the back mount of the chassis to try to get some heat out of it. But, you know, these are on all the time, especially in studios. They may never be shut off. So they're going to be running hot inside there all the time, which is why it's important to use the better quality caps. One quick thing I want to do, too, is that all the chips are socketed. I just want to reseat them a little bit just to make sure that, you know, they're properly in their socket and there's no corrosion or anything there that's causing... You know, potential problems so you don't really need to remove them just lift each end up and, and set them back down that'll be enough to you know, just ensure that they're making a good contact to the socket itself so the EEPROMs on these do go bad to contain the software and this could potentially explain why the algorithms are not working as far as there's no reverb on the actual reverb programs uh, for any setting for that matter even you know both algorithms because the ROMs go bad, they're corrupt, the CPU tries to load, you know, the, the firmware or the actual code off of the ROMs, doesn't do anything because it's corrupt, locks up, doesn't, you know, essentially it's not doing any DSP processing. So it could be a guess that these are bad in my case and I need to replace them. So you can buy them, there's a bunch of people who sell them for 30, 35 bucks, but I've got the ROMs, so I'm just going to reburn my uh, reburn them myself. You can download the PCM60 software versions, both the 1.0 and the 2.0 software, from a couple sites out there. There's people who try to sell the ROMs, you know, the actual um, bin files too for these, but they're out there. If you just look, you can find them. So the 1.0 software, which is what I have in my unit, uses 27C32 EEPROMs, which I've gone through all my EEPROMs, and I've got four of them. So I went through, I've got a couple bags of them, and i got a ton of other ones too that actually came from... Um, slot machines and video poker machines and stuff like that back from the 80s and 90s. It's just a random assortment of all sorts of games. Uh, I picked these up a while ago on eBay. There's somebody selling them. I bought them strictly just for the EEPROMs because they were super cheap. And uh, 10, 15 years ago, you could buy lots of EEPROMs for next to nothing, but now that they're getting more and more rare, uh, they're becoming more and more expensive. So when I find lots like this, I always grab them up just so I have them. So I went through all these, and amazingly I have exactly four 27C32s, which is great. But after I um, erase these and actually blank check them and verify them, I'll be shocked if all four are actually good. On the other hand, I've got a ton of 27C64s, which is the 2.0 version software uses. So, and these actually have matched, like these are all AMD, this entire section right here. So I've got seven AMDs, potentially more. I just grabbed the ones I saw that didn't have the stickers that were in the way of them. I probably have a ton more once I start pulling the stickers off of these. Regarding these two, I've potentially thought about reading them all and just backing them up, which I may do when I'm bored someday. I mean, there might be some value to these for game collectors and, you know, slot machine, people restoring old slot machines and stuff. So it is something I'm going to consider. I'm not going to just destroy all these, but none of these are all unlabeled anyway, so I may just read them, uh, pull off whatever's on there inside, you know, inside them. There'll probably be some, you know, text in there as a, as a comment or some other field that you'll be able to pull off, you know, from the, uh, from the bin file that'll indicate what they are, so I'll be able to back them up and, and name them at least and have an idea what they, what they're for. Regardless, I'm going to, I'm going to burn, I'm going to erase them all, and then I'm going to burn the 2.0, well, I'll try the 1.0 firmware first, because that's what's in here. And then if these are not good, the, the four I have here, I will still burn the 2.0 software and then try those next. And the sockets are big enough for both. You'll see that, you know, there's extra pins there that the, the smaller 27C32 EEPROMs, or ROMs in this case, plug into. But you've got the four extra pins that'll accept the larger EEPROM. 
between the 1.0 and 2.0 software, there are some differences. There were some improvements in 2.0. Some people still say the 1.0 is, is the better software. I don't know. I've got both. If I can get both written to these, I'll try both if that resolves the problem, of course. But um, we'll see. So right now, I'll, I'll work on that. One more to go. So we will give these a try. I label these originals just to make sure I don't get the order of them mixed up and if I, if I need to put them back in. What I'm also going to do is since I have the version 1 ROMs and I believe these are the version 1 uh, ROMs in here, I can, I can load up the actual bin file and verify check them and actually see if they're bad or not. Assuming they'll even read, but slowly another test I'll do here in a bit. So where I'm at right now is I ended up successfully burning my EEPROMs, so I actually put the version 2 software on here and swapped out the version 1 chips which are installed. Made no difference at all. Like the unit behaved the exact same way, which is audio was passing through it, you know, basically unmodified without any reverb or reverb at all. So I knew that the ROMs weren't the problem. Secondly, I actually did verify all these ROMs in my programmer based on the bin files I had for each one, and they all passed. So they all verified okay, so I know they're good. So I don't need to worry about that at this point. Next up was I was kind of curious about the audio bypass, which I mentioned. And looking at the schematics, you know, it, it made no sense because the audio input from the main input here essentially passes directly through all the way down straight across to the outputs, unmodified, where there's the relay right there that basically this relay, this circuitry down here controls the relay, which fires these two switches, which basically switches the outputs from direct bypass, which is this audio path, to you know the circuitry which goes through there. It's one or the other. So that was working just fine. The level issue I'm having is strictly just because of my inputs. I've got kind of a weak input coming into it, and I'm actually I've got the level input cranked pretty much, and I had the the you know the plus four uh, dB switches in the back engaged to basically give it more gain through the circuitry and non bypass. So when I turn bypass on, it attenuates it, which is why you're hearing it lower. When I played with some gain levels a little bit. I noticed that actually it didn't matter. I was getting audio just fine through bypass. So I know that has nothing to do with the circuitry or any type of fault with the unit uh, right now. That's fine. So next step is I began to probe around. So I started in the basically the analog to digital uh, audio section just to see if you know anything was happening there. And that's where I started to see some things that were peculiar. peculiar. So beginning with, this is kind of your A to D section here. You've got these analog uh, switches, two of them, which are kind of your part of your sample and hold circuitry. And you should be getting basically clocks to these, uh, driving them to do the sampling. And I wasn't doing that. There was no clock whatsoever driving these. So it basically is these two pins labeled here that are labeled out, uh, coming out of this, this these two, um, what are they? They are actually, they are DG211 analog switches. So two of them there, or I should say one chip with two switches inside it, and they're both driven by the same clock signals. So I started probing that backwards. And following that schematic there, that circuitry. So this page is where it continues. So my two outs are, you know, labeled pins are right here. It goes through this hex inverter, which I wasn't getting any signal there. It goes through this NAND gate, uh, which partly is just, you know, goes to the sample circuitry, and then there is the muting option uh, right there as well, which mutes the... Um, sampling portion of it, which I thought, hey, maybe that's part of it, but um, that's not it because I'm not getting any clock on pin 5 here, which then goes down to this chip, which is a 74175 uh, dual D-type flip-flop. And on the sampling circuitry right here, I can actually probe that. And on pins 10, so pin 10 is one of the, the Q outputs on that D flip-flop. 
and that's actually what which goes to the sampling circuitry. And I've got nothing at all. Um, you know, not even five volts. It's just the ground. So Q2 for that same uh, D flip flop in there, the output, the second Q output, which is pin 11. There, it's stuck at five volts. So it's definitely not flipping or flopping. So the input to that, which is pin 12, which is actually the clock, exists. So I've got clock into the input of that D of that one flip flop inside that package, and it's not flipping the outputs. So just to verify, I checked you know the other two or three flip flops in here, and the other ones are working. Um, I've got I've got clock into the chip as well, so I know that. I know that you know the entire, or I'm sorry, not clock, but the chip is properly enabled. So I know the chip is enabled. And on the other pins that actually have some other data going through them, I have data on all three pins showing that it's actually operating correctly. So I feel that this D flip-flop is suspect right now. Uh, this is kind of where my mystery stops at the moment because I could probe further back you know, for this data line coming in, but it's not going to help me until I remove this out of circuit to know that, you know, this isn't holding that pin low or, you know, or high for that matter. So my next step is basically to pull this chip because that's going to be the next uh, you know, problem solving step of this process. So I feel this is suspect. My clock is coming in. These specific outputs of just that D flip flop are not flip flopping back and forth. So, I mean, it's still possible something in this line could be holding, you know, those high and low, but I won't know for sure until I remove this from circuit. So that's the next step I'm going to do. All right, so here I've got that U27, the 74175 removed. I'm going to replace it with a socket and then locate another one of these. i got one around somewhere. It's an LS Series 2, the low power. So I'll throw the socket in, put it in, and we'll try it out. I'll, we'll be able to tell right away if it's operational, but secondly, I'll be able to probe those pins and see if there's any difference in those uh, clock lines coming off that flip-flop. So here in this intergraph board, old intergraph board, we've got a couple of 74S 175s. So not the LS, it's the, the faster S series, a little bit more power hungry, but it's compatible with the LS, so there'll be no issues. So I'll pull that and we'll uh, swap it in. All right, so here is the socketed 74S 175. I've got it sitting right there. So everything's hooked up. I got my synth hooked back up. We will power it on. I hit a couple notes. Look at that. We got reverb. That's the played algorithm. There's the room algorithm. So there we go. That was it. That uh, quad D flip flop was the culprit in this uh, Lexicon PCM60. So uh, looks like this will be a successful repair. Now, I still want to do a few other things. I've got some more capacitors in the analog circuitry, which I'd like to replace um, in the signal path specifically. Uh, some of these may be non-polarized. It doesn't look like they are. I can't tell. I'll have to get a closer look at them there. Um, I'd still like to play with the version 2 ROMs as well, but for now I'm just going to leave the version 1 ROMs in there and get a feel for kind of what this unit sounds like. That should be it. So while I was in here, I went ahead and replaced all of the audio uh, capacitors in the audio circuitry. So this group of electrolytics right here is basically everything I just replaced. And to replace those, I used ELNA, ELNA caps. So there was two values, uh, 22 microfarad at 25 volt and a 47 microfarad at 16 volt. So ELNAs are good quality caps. Um, they're designed to be very flat over the audio spectrum. They're designed for audio use. So I use them here in this unit. Uh, they are only 85C rated. Uh, they get very expensive when you get up to 105C rated, you know, audio grade style caps. But this area of the circuitry is, you know, a little bit cooler. It's away from your power supply and heat sinks. So it's not that much of a concern. I wanted to take a quick look at the digital section in the PCM60 to kind of look over and see what's actually in here. So the main portion of the DSP is all right here. It's made up of primarily these three chips, which in the data sheet are labeled the CMU, the ARU, and the MMU. I don't know the roles of all these chips, but I do know that U19 over here, the CMU, is actually what drives the DAC, which is the Burr Brown PCM53, which we talked about. There is a 16-bit data bus coming between this chip and the Burr Brown, which is a 16-bit DAC. The other two chips, the MMU and the ARU, um, best guess, make up you know the, the hardware multiplier, which is kind of the key of most DSP. 
specifically to do the multiply and accumulate function, which you know is based. Most DSP algorithms are based on multiply accumulate math. Tied to the MMU, which is this chip over here, um, is these four NMOS uh, DRAMs. They actually are. I, I, NMOS makes both SRAM and DRAM. I couldn't tell by looking at them, you know, just by the number. But after looking them up, they are the IMS 2620s, which each one is a 16K by 4 bits um, dynamic RAM chip. So the four of them obviously make up the 16 bits times 16K, and that is the you know key portion of your DSP. Your ROMs, which actually have the algorithms for the DSP, are also tied to uh, U29 over here, which is your MMU. So this is kind of the key processor in all of the DSP. And then this is most likely, you know, a combination of these is actually doing possibly some of the math. I'm not entirely sure. There we have a successful repair on the Lexicon PCM60. Uh, hopefully this was beneficial to you. I don't know if this is a common fault or not, but this was the fault on mine, specifically that Quad D flip-flop. Again, with all these older units, I recommend replacing all the capacitors in the entire unit, especially based on the IH, and if they've never been done before, or even if they were done, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and they weren't that quality of a cap. Use good caps, you know, use a good Nippon Chemicon or a Nishicon, or in my case, Panasonic's, which I always use, uh, 105C rated always, um, to make sure it can handle the heat and give you another, you know, 20, 30 years of service, hopefully. One last thing i got to do is the actual knob for the... Uh, mix knob here came off. These are just, the, the knobs underneath are just plastic and these little metal caps are glued on. So I just need to re-glue that there. Just make sure I get it lined up quick. This one's a little scratchy too. I'll probably clean that pot with some deoxit uh, just to make sure that I'm not getting any of that noise. I've also done a repair on a Lexicon PCM70. Uh, I'll link that video down below. I think I may have mentioned that already. But that was also an interesting repair. Um, a lot of good TTL logic debugging that went into that to actually resolve it and get a completely dead unit working. So, so I hope this was beneficial and thank you for watching.